and welcome to Virtual America's Small Business Development Conference. My name is Peter Harriman, and I'm going to be presenting on S Corp, LLC, C Corp, what the difference is between these different entities. It's a core level course that's going to be looking at the most common question that we get in our industry. And that question is, what type of business entity should I be and why? Today, we're going to go through some introductions what goes into choosing an entity type, what the choices are, breaking down those differences and bringing it all together. In this presentation, I'm gonna show you an easy way to present the different entity types to a client so they get a better understanding of their choices. And as advisors, remember, we're just giving them choices. We're not making the decision for them. But at the end of the presentation, you should know the basic business entity options, the most common reasons clients have for choosing those options, and the ability to discuss with your clients the pros and cons of these options. Now, my name is Peter Harriman, and I work at the Portland Center for the Small Business Development Center at Maine. I'm hosted by the University of Southern Maine. And I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my whole team. We have advisors that cover all 21 locations throughout the state of Maine, and Maine is a big state. So we have a great. I do start with a disclaimer to most of my clients. The first question I ask a client is always, how did you hear about us? Because they just want to know what marketing works. But I always follow up, letting them know that I do not provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. The talk that we're going to have today that I explained with the client is, uh, just that, it's advising. Uh, I'm going to tell them the, the basic pros and cons and they have to make the decision themselves. And ultimately, the final decision should be made in consultation with a lawyer or an accountant, depending on the conversation. So back to the common question. What type of business entity should I be and why? I commonly ask this question to my clients uh, when they come in to see me and I get a range of answers, right? Any from, anything from, I want to become legitimate, a legitimate business, I want to hire employees, I need to make sure I make the right decision now because I can't change, or the two reasons that are always on the list of why I chose my business entity are liability protection and taxes. Um, so what are our most common choices? Uh, there are, we're going to go from the, the most basic choice to the most complex choice. Okay, so the choices that we have are a sole proprietor if you're a one owner, partnership if it's more than one owner, LLC, which can cover one or more owners, and a corporation, again, one or more owners. Now, there are more types of businesses than just these four. But these four are the most common types of businesses that you're going to see uh, any client come in with. So those are the four that we're going to focus on today. So if we break down the sole proprietor and what that is, the ownership structure for sole proprietor is that it's one business owner, right? It is the default form of business. So if you start selling anything, by default, you are a sole proprietor. In Maine, a sole proprietor has to register with their town, but not the state. Uh, in Northern Maine, especially, where a lot of woods, some towns don't even have a registration. So again, sole proprietor is the easiest form of business to get into. Once you start business, it's the default form of business. So that's one of the largest pros, one of the pluses to being a sole proprietor. It's real easy to get into business right? Not much paperwork. However, one of the biggest drawbacks to a sole proprietor and one of the most common reasons I have businesses who are sole proprietors and they talk to me about switching to an LLC or another type of uh, business structure is that sole proprietors, you are the business. It has what we call full liability. So as a sole proprietor, Yes, you might have what's called a DBA, a doing business as, and you have a different name for your business. But when it comes down to it, you are the business, which means that if you get sued, the business gets sued. Or if the business gets sued, you get sued. There is no legal difference one way or the other. 
uh, between the business and you. That's why you see a lot of sole proprietors out there will use their social security number as their tax ID, which is fine, that's acceptable. Some do go to the effort of registering with the IRS to get a separate EIN for their sole proprietorship, and it's free from the IRS. The IRS will never get between you and paying taxes. So you could get an EIN if you wanted to as a sole proprietor, but many of them that, that we see in Maine anyway, they just simply use their social security number. And they can do that because again, you are the business as a sole proprietor. So you have that full liability. Taxes for a sole proprietor are Schedule C taxes. Now, what is Schedule C? Schedule C is simply a worksheet that you do that you include in your personal taxes. Right, so it's not its own separate tax form that you're gonna mail in separately to the IRS. It's just a worksheet that's trying to determine what your taxable income for a business is. And you include that worksheet in your personal taxes. Now let's go on to partnership. Partnerships are whenever you get two or more business owners um, that are working together. Typically, you want a partnership to have a written partnership agreement. Uh, there are many, many, many stories that you can probably hear, especially if you've been doing this job for a while as an advisor, where partnerships did not have a very strong or any written agreement. And if the partnership were to dissolve later, it, it's not very clear on how that dissolution of the partnership works because there's no agreement on it. So, uh, I always tell my uh, clients that if you're a partnership, whenever there's two or more people working in a business together, it's always a good idea to have some kind of written agreement on how that works, right? And so I advise any business with more than one owner that you really should get a lawyer involved. Now, the liability for a partnership is much like the sole proprietor each partner is fully liable. Now, sometimes people get confused with this because they believe, uh, let's say there's two partners and it's a 50-50 partnership. They believe they're only 50% liable. That's not true. If your partner were to um, skip town, so to say, uh, you are still, because you are one of the partners in the business, you will then be held fully liable. So each partner is fully liable for whatever the partnership uh, is liable for. So even if one partner is at fault, you're all liable, right? So with the sole proprietor and the partnership having such high liability, it's always a perfect segue for me to talk about business insurance with my clients uh, to advise them, hey, your business entity structure should not be the only protection you have for your business. It might be a good idea to look at business insurance. So that is your first line of defense. Your second line of defense should uh, be the uh, business entity type, but it shouldn't necessarily be your first. So again, this is a good way to segue into talking about business insurance with your clients. Now the taxes for a partnership are slightly different than the sole proprietor. Um, they're the 1065 partnership return, and the 1065 return is a little longer than the Schedule C, so it's a little more work, but we'll, it's basically getting to the same idea as a Schedule C, which is what is the net income that we're gonna be taxed on? It then takes that a step further and each partner is going to be issued what's called a K-1, which divides the profit of that partnership depending on what the partner's split was. So if you have a 50-50 partnership, that's pretty easy. The net profit is going to be divided 50% and 50%. So each K-1 that each partner gets is going to be a 50% uh, return. If it's a 30, 30, 60, then two K-1s will be 30% and one will be 40%, right? So it all equals 100%, but the K-1 just simply splits up the profit between the partners depending on their level of partnership. Now the limited liability company, often referred to as the LLC. Um, this one is one or more owners, right? So uh, unlike the sole proprietor or the partnership where it's based on how many owners, the limited liability company um, can be one or more. It does require an operating agreement. 
uh, LLCs are under contract law. Um, so in Maine, especially, even if it's one owner for a limited liability company, it still should have an operating agreement, which is the contract between the state and the business on how it does, uh, how it conducts its business and what laws it's subject to. The liability of an LLC is uh, where most people uh, are, are attracted to, right? So the LLC structure allows you to essentially create two U's, right? It splits you into a business you and a personal you, right? So remember the sole proprietor and the partnership, you and the business were, were one, you had full liability. Here, it's splitting you. The business you is the LLC under the EIN, an employee identification number, right? So it's a tax ID that you get just for the business from the IRS. And that's your business you. And you want to conduct all of your business under that EIN. Whereas the personal you, that's your social security number. That's all of your personal assets, right? And it's trying to divide the business you from the personal you. And it's very important, vitally important, if you're an LLC, that you keep that division, right? You don't want, ever want to pierce that corporate veil because that's your protection. Right? So if something were to happen and someone were to sue the LLC, then uh, as long as there's no criminal negligence involved, they're, they're going to look at the business you right, side of things. So everything under the business you, under that tax ID, is up for grabs in a lawsuit, where the personal you should hypothetically be protected uh, on the other side of that, that divide. Right? Now, if, you know, there's some businesses that uh, they form an LLC, but they, they pierce that veil, right? They um, treat the LLC just like a sole proprietorship would. And that means uh, they use the LLC uh, business account to pay directly for some of their personal expenses, uh, cars or whatnot, uh, mortgages. Uh, when you do that, and you, every time you pierce that corporate veil, you're losing your limited liability protection because what they do is they look at the different buckets, the business you and the personal you, and if you've been using those, them interchangeably, then that, there is no two use. The personal you and the business you is going to be viewed as one. So again, the most, one of the most important things for a limited liability company is to keep that business you separate from the personal you, okay? Now, a fun history lesson, which seems like like we're getting off topic, but we're not. This is going to be a uh, tie into the tax forms of the LLC. So a history lesson on the LLC. The LLC was first formed in 1977 in Wyoming. 1977, that means it is the baby of the business world. Uh, corporations have been around for, for hundreds of years and the sole proprietor, you know, default form of business has been around for hundreds of years but the LLC is relatively new in the business world. Today, over two thirds of all new companies in the US are formed are LLCs. The IRS largely ignored LLCs for the first 11 years of its, its existence, right? So the IRS ignored it, and so the LLC doesn't have its own tax forms. Instead, the LLC actually borrows its tax forms depending on how you form the LLC, right? And this is where the number of owners does matter. So if you are a one member LLC, then you're going to be, you're going to by default do the Schedule C taxes just like a sole proprietor. The only difference is on the Schedule C, if you're an LLC, there is a line for your EIN number. Now, if you're two or more owners, you're going to do the, by default, the partnership return uh, for the LLC taxes. Uh, and it's gonna look exactly the same with the K-1s and everything. So interesting, the LLC does not have its own tax forms, but it borrows the tax forms because the IRS pretty much ignored it during its early existence. Now, there is one thing that I'm going to mention, but I'm going to get back to later. The LLC also has a unique ability to choose to be taxed as an S Corp. So again, more on that later as we kind of break down how the three uh, 
interact with each other, the three uh, basic types of businesses. So let's look at taxes, right? And this is part of the, the sheet that I usually go over with, with businesses. So on the left side, if we group together all the businesses that we just talked about, the sole prop, partnership, and LLC, right? And again, the default forms of taxes for one is a Schedule C and for two or more is a partnership return. And if we try to, try to get to the meat of the bones is how much did you have in income? So let's say we had $80,000 in sales, less the expenses for the business. So let's say there were $30,000 in expenses. So the taxable income is $50,000, right? Whether it's a sole proprietor, partnership, or LLC, this $50,000 is after expenses, what you have for taxable income. Remember taxable income, if you're one of these uh, three entities, the taxable income, your net profit, that's your pay, right? So if you're a sole proprietor partnership or uh, a member of an LLC, you do not have to be on payroll. Your pay is gonna be part of this 50,000 taxable income, right? Now, if you're a partner, you're going to, have K-1s that split up that 50,000, depending on how much uh, of a, of a ownership stake you have in the partnership. Um, but there's one thing I like to point out is the taxable income that you earn for the year, the IRS never asks you, how much did you leave in the bank and how much did you pay yourself? The IRS does not care. What the IRS is wondering and what they tax you on is how much did you make for this year? So in this case, we made 50,000 for the year. So even if you did not pay yourself $50,000, you did not take out as an owner's draw $50,000, they're still going to tax you on it. So after many years, if you did not take out the full amount, you might have a pretty hefty sum in your bank account. And a lot of clients will come in and say, well, I don't know what to do with that money because I don't want to be taxed on it. Well, you're already taxed. The IRS taxes you each year on the total amount of net profit you make. So feel free to use the money in your bank account. It's already been taxed. You just wanna make sure each year that you're, you're looking at the total sales and total expenses to get your taxable income. Now, what happens to that 50,000 if you're a sole proprietor, partnership, or LLC? First, that 50,000 is going to be assessed self-employment uh, taxes. This is often called the FICA taxes. This is Social Security and Medicare. Um, this is 15.3%, which sounds like a lot until you understand where that, that sum comes from. As an employee, your employer, whether you know it or not, pays half of your Social Security and Medicare. So as an employee, when you get your paycheck, 7.65% of your paycheck goes to Social Security and Medicare. When you're self-employed, you are acting as both employee and employer. So you are paying both the employee and the employer share. So 7.65 on either end, that's where that 15.3% comes from, is the Social Security and Medicare of the employee and employer combined, right? So first you're, you're gonna pay that self-employment tax. And the second hit that you're gonna take is the income tax. In Maine, we have state income tax, some states don't, but this is where you're gonna pay either federal uh, and state income tax. And, just for uh, illustrative purposes, we're gonna put that at about 10 to 15%. Now, when I'm talking with a client, I make very clear to them that the number one here, the self-employment taxes, that's a set rate. The number two, the income tax, that's gonna be dependent on your total household income, right? So uh, if you have a partner or you make more, you're, you're gonna have a higher income tax rate. So right now we're just doing this for an illustrative purpose so we can compare all the different uh, business entities we're going to talk about today. So when we combine those, the total tax that we find is 25 to 30 percent. And that 25 to 30 percent when uh, people come in and ask me what should I expect for taxes, that's what we usually tell them is plan on 25 to 30 percent of taxes that you're going to pay. And remember these taxes on your taxable net profit, your pay after expenses. So that's why you see a lot of businesses sometimes go out and spend a lot of money, buy a new car, whatever. And 
I don't normally tell people go out and spend money just so you can lower your taxes. But if you do need that equipment, then there is ways that you can talk with your accountant and do some tax planning strategies to try to minimize the taxes that you're paying. Remember, not avoiding taxes, we're just doing a strategy to minimize them, right? So sole prop partnership and LLC, 25 to 30% is what, what you should plan on taxes. Now we're gonna flip over. We're gonna talk about corporations. And corporations have long been considered the ultimate protection uh, for a business. Why? Because the LLC, as you saw, there's a business you and the personal you. And in the sole proprietor and partnership, there's you as well, but it's still you, right? In a corporation, the corporate structure takes you out of the picture, right? When you file for a corporation, the corporation is actually its own legal person with its own rights, right? So when you form a corporation, congratulations, you've just created a person in the eyes of the law. So that person is who ends up getting sued. And you, as the owner of a, of a business, you're an employee of that person, right? Now, keep your eyes on the news, um, because as I said, the corporations have long been thought to be the gold standard for ultimate protection. However, we have seen um, some lawsuits come through for the pharmaceutical companies where they're trying to bypass the corporation and go after the owners directly. Um, so that might signal a change in that protection status. So keep an eye on the news for those lawsuits. But for now, corporations are still considered the ultimate gold standard for protection. Now, how is a ownership of a corporation dealt with? Well, uh, a corporation has stocks and so there's stockholders. Often the corporation's run by CEO, which is usually the owner of the business, uh, and that is an employee of the corporation. And it's typically overseen by a board who can also be the CEO. Um, the big thing to remember is corporations have articles and bylaws. So one corporation looks like another corporation looks like another corporation. There are certain rules that a corporation has to abide by. Remember, corporations have been around for hundreds of years. So when we're talking about investors, investors typically feel more comfortable investing in a corporation because they understand, because corporations have set rules, they understand what it means to be a 10% investor in a corporation. So if we're talking investment money, corporations have those rules that protect the investors, or at least the investors understand how those rules affect them, uh, because it's, it's set up by statutes and regulations. I typically advise people, if you're going to do a corporation, you probably want to get a lawyer involved because you can set up a corporation wrong if you don't know the rules that you need to follow. So at least have a conversation with a lawyer to make sure you understand those rules. Now, that's in contrast to the LLC. Remember the LLC was under contract law? Contract law is much more flexible. It's whatever two parties agree to. Now, because so many businesses are becoming LLCs, that is, that's changing where investors are feeling more comfortable, but typically investors will gravitate towards corporations. So that's one of the pros to being a corporation. The liability of a corporation, as I said, that's really where, uh, where the gold standard is for the corporation because the corporation is legally considered its own person. You, if you're the owner and you're the CEO, you are an employee. So you're gonna be on payroll. Uh, you're gonna get a paycheck. Um, and if the corporation gets sued, it's that person getting sued. Taxes are where most people don't like corporations, right? It's one of the, the biggest cons, and you often hear of it, double taxation. Double taxation comes in where that legal person that you just created for that liability protection, well, that person you created, the IRS wants taxes from as well, because the IRS wants every person to pay taxes on the money that they've earned. So if you're going to get the liability protection of having a legal person, you're going to also pay the taxes. So the person that you created, the corporation, is going to have their very own tax return, the 1120 return. And it has its own due date and its own, uh, its own form that you're going to do. Uh, so you want to be, pay attention to that. It's not like the sole proprietor or the partnership. Um, or the LLC up until now, where you just kind of included worksheets with your own taxes. This one 
has its very own tax form because remember you're treating the corporation like its own person um, if you're the owner you're going to get two forms right you're going to get a w-2 form which is your salary and you're going to get a 1099 dividend for anything above and beyond the salary that your corporation makes and we're going to get to that in an illustration so you'll understand so let's look at that let's add in corporations so what we're going to do with the corporation again the 1120 tax form we're going to take the taxable income that we found on the left because we want to compare apples to apples so we're going to use the same numbers in all three examples here so we're going to assume that your corporation did ninety thousand dollars in sales and we had thirty thousand expenses to come up with sixty thousand in taxable income right so we're going to take the left we're going to move it over to the right so the six sixty thousand in taxable income we're going to assume it, it operated the same with the exception that now, because it's a corporation, you are now an employee of the corporation. So you are going to have to have a salary. You're going to be on payroll. And that payroll isn't as, it, it is a valid business expense, right? So that payroll is where your W-2 income earnings is going to be. And the W-2 earnings is taxed. Uh, and it's taxed, uh, the self-employment tax, uh, or, you know, it's taxed Social Security and Medicare, and corporation pays half, you pay half, and it's taxed income tax. Right, um, and then there's that twenty thousand left over. If we're using this as an example, so that twenty thousand that is left over, that is going to be issued as a dividend. Uh, the the excess, that dividend is where you see that double taxation. Right, so the IRS wants wants your person to pay on the profit of the business, and it's going to have you pay. How that person pays is through corporate taxes. Right, and the corporate tax rate used to be 35%, and then in 2018, the tax law changed, and that went down to 21%. And that's, you probably heard that in the news quite a bit. It was quite a boon to corporations, it was quite, uh, quite good. Um, the other tax that you're gonna pay, so that's the, the person side of, of the corporation paying tax, the one that you created. The other tax, the income tax, we're going to leave it the same as we had on the other side. We're going to assume 10 to 15 percent. We're going to assume your income is about the same, right? So when you add these up, the total tax that you're paying is 31 to 36 percent, right, on the dividend, right? So you already had payroll up here, and that payroll has its own taxes, but the dividend is going to, you are going to pay a little higher taxes than you would if you were a sole proprietor or a partnership or an LLC, because you're paying for that gold standard of protection. You're paying for that separation of legal liability. You're paying for that phantom person you legally created to help protect you. So it is a little higher in taxes. There is some, uh, some double taxation going on, um, but there's a reason for it. Now let's get into the sub chapter S corporations, right? So many, many, many of my clients will come in and they've heard rumors about S corporations. Uh, most often I hear incorrectly that uh, they believe S corporations means you don't pay any taxes, uh, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, but S corporations stands for the S chapter of the IRS tax law, right? And this is the very interesting thing that not many people know you can select S corporation uh, tax status, either as an LLC or as a corporation. So if you're an LLC, you can choose to be taxed like an S corp, or if you're a corporation, you can choose to be taxed like an S corp. So you can get to S corp taxation from either end, right? The difference being how that business is structured because um, the S corp, uh, status is just a tax status, and we'll get to that, right? Now, S Corps, when you choose an S Corp, there are some restrictive rules that you're going to have to follow, those rules being um, limit on ownership, uh, who can be owners, limit on 100 owners total, uh, and some other rules. So you definitely want to talk to an accountant or a lawyer uh, before you choose Chapter S, but um, it can benefit you, and we're going we're gonna to see that. The liability of an S Corp, as I said, it's the underlying business that is the S Corp status. So if, if you have an LLC as an S Corp, then you're going to have the same tax liability because legally you're an LLC. You're just taxed as an S Corp. If you are a corporation, 
um, and you choose S Corp, well, you have the legal protections as a corporation because that's your legal status versus your tax status, right? So remember, the S Corp election is a tax status, not a legal status necessarily. You're still gonna have default to whatever your, your default company is. Now, if you're a new business um, and you know right away you're going to elect S Corp status right from the beginning, uh, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200. I see a lot of accountants and lawyers start your business as a corporation and then immediately file the S Corp paperwork so that you immediately have a tax status of an S Corp. Um, but you have the protection of a corporation, right? Um, and I also see a lot of LLCs that as they get going, and usually year three or four, they're making quite a bit of money, rather than change their whole status to a corporation, they might file as an S Corp status as well, um, just to get uh, ease some of their tax burden. Again, we're gonna get to that. So the taxes is where the magic happens. So let's bring up that diagram again. And remember, this is, this is a diagram I actually show or go through with clients because it allows me to bring up a lot of pros and cons of the different business entity types and how they're taxed, right? So we've already gone through the sole proprietor partnership LLC and how that's taxed. We've already gone through the corporations and how that's taxed. So again, the S Corp is kind of a marriage of the LLC and the corporation. You can get to it from either side. An LLC can be taxed like an S Corp or a corporation can be taxed like an S Corp. So if we have an S Corp, the tax form of an S Corp is 1120S, right? So it's, it's a corporation uh, tax wise. So it has that slightly different tax form. So it's going to have its different due dates. It's going to be a separate tax form than your individual tax form. So it's not a worksheet. It is its own tax form. Um, we're going to use the same numbers so we can pick, compare apples to apples. So we're going to use the same as we have for the corporations, right? The 60,000 of taxable income. Remember your corporate, your structured tax-wise as a corporation, so you're gonna be on payroll. And I'm gonna put a little star right there by salary, and we'll get to that. So $40,000 payroll, let's say, with 20,000 left over. And that star for the salary is because we wanna come back and we wanna really talk about reasonable salary, because that is one of the linchpins of the S Corp tax status. You as an owner, have to have a reasonable salary. That's one of the tests that the IRS will perform on an S Corp is did the owner pay themselves a reasonable salary? And when we say reasonable, it's not reasonable as compared to what you made. It's reasonable as far as if I were to pay someone in my same position, how much could they expect to make? You know, regardless of what my corporation made, what is the reasonable salary? Uh, or think of it this way, if I had to pay someone to replace myself to do the job I'm doing because I'm an employee, so if I had to pay another employee to do exactly what I'm doing, what would I have to pay that employee as a reasonable salary, right? Now that $20,000 that's left over after payroll, we're gonna call that a distribution. I have seen on the internet, if you, you go searching a little more on this subject, I have seen a lot of literature that calls it a dividend as well. Um, but I like to call it a distribution, uh, just to make sure that we have this clear distinction in the client's mind of the corporate dividend versus the S Corp distribution, right? Now, the big, big thing that people are attracted to for the S Corp is that 20,000 distribution skips the number one on either side, right? So on the sole proprietor partnership LLC side, there's self-employment tax. And on the corporate side, there's corporate tax for that number one hit, right? So this distribution does not have self-employment tax assessed to it and does not have corporate tax assessed to it, right? So that's where a lot of people say, well, there's no taxes on the distribution. Well, that's wrong. There's actually income tax, right? Federal and state income tax, which is between 10 and 15%, if we keep our example, right? That's just an example. It might be higher if you have a higher income, might be lower if you have a lower income, but you still have income tax on that distribution. So the most common thing I, I see people, uh, when they're talking to me, um, they say it's, it's tax-free, it's not tax-free. 20,000 still has income. You're gonna get a K-1 from 
uh, the corporation is going to issue a K-1 to you on that distribution amount, a W-2 on the payroll, but a K-1 for that 20000 And that K-1 will then be put on your personal taxes and you'll be assessed the income tax for that as earnings. But no self-employment tax, no corporate tax, right? So when we look at the total tax on that distribution, remember just the distribution, it's about 10 to 15% in our example. Um, so that's a pretty good savings over the 25 to 30 or the 31 to 36 for that distribution. Um, and, and payroll, the 40,000, that's gonna be assessed its own taxes, right? It's gonna have social security, Medicare, um, and income tax as well. So we're only talking about the distribution as far as that tax savings, which means that reasonable salary that we have been discussing, that is again, the key when you're talking to a client about if they wanted to choose S Corp status or not, remember we're not telling them what to do. I never say right or wrong uh, with a client when I'm discussing the different business entities, there's just pros and cons, right? So with the S Corp, it can be a great tax strategy for a lot of the businesses that we deal with, as long as they keep in mind reasonable salary. So what I often advise to my clients is, hey, if you're thinking about an S corporation and you're already in business, do a projection for the next year, right? You know, wait for the end of the year uh, till December or something in January or February, sit down, look at what you did this past year, do a projection for the future year and look at what you would have to pay yourself for a reasonable salary. Now, once you take out the reasonable salary, how much of a distribution are you left with? Because that's where the tax savings is gonna come in. Because remember with an S corp, there's a couple a couple different expenses that you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind is, this is a whole separate tax form, so you might pay more for a tax form. And if, especially you're the only owner, you're gonna have payroll, right? If you have many employees, throwing yourself on payroll is not gonna cost so much, but if you're just starting payroll and you're the only person, then that's gonna be an expense that you didn't expect. So look at, you know, do a projection, estimate your reasonable salary or talk to an accountant to understand your reasonable salary. You should always have something written. So if the IRS ever asks you, hey, what is a reasonable salary? You have, you have an understanding of how you got to that number. So find a reasonable salary and figure out what that distribution is to understand if that is going to be worthwhile, right, to, to take. As I said, I will go through this with a client on a whiteboard um, and go through each section the same uh, order that we've got done today because it allows me to bring up all these different topics about the different business entities. And again, these are just the most common entities. There are, there are a few others, but um, you're not gonna see those other ones very, very often. These are the, the primary ones that we deal with. In summary, to wrap up, We've gone through the four most common business entity types, their ownership structure, liability, and tax structure, along with pros and cons and differences between each of them. Right? So you can speak intelligently to your clients about the differences. Remember, we're just advisors, right? So a lot of my clients will laugh because um, I will take those three columns and I will go through it with them and I will talk for half an hour to an hour with them about the differences between the business entities. Remember, I don't use right or wrong uh, for the clients when I'm talking about business entities, um, but I'll go through the three columns. At the end of it, the clients tell me they have a much better understanding of the differences and which choice they wanna make based on that, but they'll laugh because I've never told them which choice they think I sh that I think they should do. And they often will ask me, what should I do? I don't tell them. I tell them it's your choice. You as the business owner, you're in the hot seat. Um, uh, my choice is just to give you some of the broad strokes of what the business entity choices are and what the pros and cons, liability, tax structure, everything that we've gone over today. Um, usually it takes me about half an hour to go through those three columns with a, with a client um, so that they understand the differences. But even if I don't go through the three columns, just understanding it myself in my head as I talk to a client really helps me probe the client as far as what, you know, why are you choosing this business entity, uh, right? Because that's the, the biggest question we get is, what business entity should I get? And most commonly, they're asking because of liability or taxes. It's not the only reason. Uh, they have other reasons, but liability and taxes usually is the reason that comes up the most.
Um, so using those three columns, that method that I showed you, really allows us to dive into different topics, especially um, like insurance, needing business insurance and whatnot. Uh, and it really, really clears it up for the client. But remember, this is just an overview. I always encourage uh, clients to talk to a lawyer or accountant when they make their final decision, right? Because I'm just there to give them a broad overview. If they're making a final decision, they should really talk to an expert in the field uh, to be able to either finalize that or understand what that decision fully means um, for the pros and cons. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.